Begin reading at verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen God. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is the real food, and my blood is the real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe in who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave, too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know you are the Holy One. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. The story we come to today is a bit unusual uh, than many of the passages that we read. And it's surprising to many who read it. Because the way that Jesus handles the situation may not be the way in which we think that he would. We clearly see that Jesus is upsetting many people here by the things that he is saying. In fact, leading to such a degree that many people have decided that they are no longer going to follow him. This, this is too hard. And they turn and they leave. You see, we're taught, and rightly so most of the time, that when someone doesn't understand things, well, we break it down and we make it easier for them. When someone finds something difficult, we attempt in every capacity to explain it to them. And we certainly expect that of Jesus. But what is surprising in our passage is that not only does not Jesus do that, he continues to again reiterate and use language that is even more devices as he continues to speak. Instead of opening doors, he erects obstacles. We go back earlier in this same chapter, in chapter 6, we have a picture of Jesus there feeding the multitudes of people. Many had come and followed him because they had seen and they had experienced that miracle firsthand. And this, you would think, would be a perfect opportunity for Jesus to add more followers. 
for they had seen what he is capable of. They had seen what they did. They had experienced that very miracle. And yet, right after that, or very closely after that, in a passage that we didn't read in verse 26, Jesus begins by telling them, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw some miraculous sign, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give. You didn't follow me because of these signs. You followed me because I gave you something to eat. And so often in life, we follow the things because, you know, we're hungry or we're thirsty or we're something that pulls us and we're just trying to meet those physical needs. And Jesus is saying, but if you eat, you're still going to be hungry tomorrow. You're still going to be thirsty tomorrow. Don't worry about this food that is going to be spoiled tomorrow. Worry about the food that can give you life forever. And so he begins gently enough reminding them of the importance of the spiritual things over the physical things. And in verse 33, he tells them for the first time there that the bread of God is he that has come down from heaven and they respond by saying, Lord, then give us this bread. Then if there's food that's going to keep us alive forever, give us that. Where's that? Okay, we had enough of this other bread. Give us this bread so that we can live forever. And then Jesus has to tell them plainly, I am the bread of life. When you eat of me, you will never go hungry. He that believes in me will never be Thirsty, But again, they didn't really quite understand the metaphor that he was talking about to ingest and to follow him, that he was the thing that was going to give them life because they said, or they began to rumble among themselves because they're like, what is he talking about? They're upset as they begin to get a little bit more because then Jesus reminds them of their past. Something that everyone held up and remembered as this most wonderful thing that almost had ever happened to the people. About time that Moses had led them, about the manna that had come down, about what God had given to them. And they remember that and they celebrate. And then Jesus tells them about this. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. This thing that they held up as the greatest achievement, maybe that they or had ever heard of or experienced, that they celebrated and remembered. They ate that food, yeah, and they still died. I'm trying to tell you about something that is much more important. Something that can make you live forever. We have to remember, too, that the Jewish people, because of God's commands, had very strict dietary restrictions about what they could and couldn't eat. And, of course, when Jesus makes this radical suggestion then to them, when he goes far beyond what any PR person would suggest, when he tells them that, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Stunning. What is this man talking about? Eating his flesh? Drinking his blood? In fact, he tells them, if you don't do this, you have no life in you. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? <coughs> And certainly they don't expect to, him to just rip off a piece of his arm and they start to eat it. Is that what he means? Now we think, oh no, of course it's easy. It's a, it's a metaphor, right? That if you don't ingest who Jesus is, if you don't allow him to be that which sustains you, to be the most important thing that gives you energy, that makes you wake up, that reminds you that when you sleep, the last thing that you say, that everything in your life isn't based on Jesus. Our source of energy, our source of who we are is going to lead us astray. Because our bellies, they're going to lead us astray. We're going to need food again. We're going to need drink again. And even sometimes, you know, we gather together. Of course, we celebrate a beautiful thing like communion. And we gather together and we have bread and we have a cup. But just doing that even act, we know, is no more than drinking of the cup and eating the bread if we don't know who Jesus is. If we aren't allowing Jesus to say, it's not about gathering together for a moment to have your bellies filled. It's about radically changing you from the inside out. Because when you eat something, as it's been said, you are what you eat. 
And what eventually you eat and drink, it influences your body and the outcome of your body and how healthy or unhealthy you are. And if you're going to be spiritually healthy, you need to ingest who Jesus is. One of the important points that might be noted here, too, how radical and how weird this might have sounded is Jesus didn't just use the verb to eat here that's the most normal use of the verb. He used the verb uh, in the language that implied to gnaw, to chew, to really just... I mean, so that's the level set. He's not talking about taking a dainty little sip. He's like, you are chewing this. This is something substantial. This is going to take you a while to break down in your mouth in order to swallow. And people, if you could imagine, they're somewhat offended by this. But in fact, as Jesus realizes that they're, that they're offended by this, he doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry, my fault, I apologize. He continues on because he wants to make this point because it is really, really important that he do so. And so he continues on. In fact, he even questions the 12 as he turns to them after other people have left. And he says, do you want to leave too? After you've heard this hard teaching, after you've heard what I've said, are you willing to stay or do you want to be like those who are turning and leaving? Why would Jesus say this? Why wouldn't he want everyone to just be with him? Why wouldn't he want everyone to continue to follow him? Because Jesus is always concerned about what's true and what's real. And he didn't want people following him that had no interest in him, who are only interested to get something out of it because their bellies are filled. He wants not followers, but disciples. He wants people that are going to change and follow him, have hearts and minds who want to know Jesus. And if they didn't want to know Jesus, that wasn't why Jesus came. So they have a choice to make. I'm going to tell you what I'm about. I don't, I don't care if everyone follows me or not. This is what is going to happen. You have to make a choice. Are you going to follow me? Or are you going to turn around and walk a different way? Because Jesus could care less about being popular or what makes the most people happy or about trends. He just wants people to know God. And he'll take the chance that people are offended. He'll take the chance that someone might walk away by proclaiming the truth. Because when you teach people something that's a hard truth, they have a choice to make. They will accept that hard truth or they will not accept that hard truth. <laughs> but it is the truth, nevertheless. And so when we're confronted with such truths as the disciples were, we have to make that same choice that those people made. Some said, this is, this is too hard. <laughs> I'm leaving. And then there were others who said, where else would we go? You are the Holy One of God. Where do we place our real faith? Are we willing to endure and to go through those things that at first seem very difficult to us? Because the truth is there are going to be obstacles and barriers in our lives. That sometimes people will be, in fact, offended by the teachings of God. They may even get angry at God. They may even turn away from God. It's not God's desire that they do so, but he's not going to lie He's going to tell the truth. We all have those difficulties in our lives that for us seem like crisis. And sometimes they make us question our faith in God because of those crises. Whether it's some sort of financial uh, setback, a serious illness, the loss of someone we greatly love or care about. And we say, but God, why didn't you do the, the thing that I wanted you to do? And then we have a choice to make when God didn't do the thing he wanted him to do. We walk away, or we continue to follow him because we know that he is the good and perfect one from God. Because sometimes it may feel in a time of our lives that, where is God? 
things feel dark, it feels absent, it feels distant. Some authors have described it as the, um, the midnight or the dark night of the soul. And it seems like nothing's getting better. You know, it's winter and it's cold and it's freezing here. I'm thinking, I know spring is coming, but I can't even quite remember what those flowers look like. It is not always easy to follow the truth of God. We don't have to pretend that it is, but it's always right and it's always true to do so. The question is not whenever obstacles, hardships, hard teaching, difficult times come. The only question is, how do we respond to them? Do we be like Peter, who represented the disciples, or those who turned and walked away? There's so many examples in the Bible of, of similar situations. You think back of the people being let out at the time of the manna of, of, of Egypt as, as slaves. And that the people were so happy as they left, that they were saved as they went through the Red Sea, you know. The, the things that looked impossible, they, they weren't part of the sea. And then God allowed it to open up, and they crossed through and there were other barriers, the wilderness, the bickering, the lack of food. But eventually, as people faced those problems, at, at, at one point, many of the people said to Moses in Exodus 16, Ah, if only we had died. If only we had died. Ah, it would have been so much better. We would have died back then. We get to points where we just think, it would be so much better if I were dead. Because we can't remember what we came from. We can't remember what God has already brought us through and what he continues to bring us through because we only can think of the here and now and the discomfort in this immediate time. And of course we get distracted by pain and discomfort. But God is with them now as he was when he, the same God as he brought them through that Red Sea, as he was in the time when they were complaining and grumbling, when they were in the tents, as it says in Psalm 113, that they grumbled in their tents and they would not obey God. You see, so that's a choice we make. When something doesn't go our way, we can sit in our tent and we can grovel and complain. And we say, okay, God, you didn't give me what I wanted, so I'm not going to do what you wanted. Like little kids. Or we can remember all the times that God has already acted in our lives. All the things that he has done to bring us through to the present place that we are. Sometimes we feel like God has told us something that we can't even believe might not even be true. We think of a story like Abraham. Hey, you're going to have a child. You're 100. Okay? Yeah, right. And then it happened. Because God takes the things that are highly improbable, and he makes them probable if he as well wants to be done. We think of Job and the story that uh, Jamie shared near the beginning of Job. And we know how Job is such a, a complicated book of, of what is happening here, of a man who lost everything, his wealth, his possessions, his health, his family. That these horrible tragedies occurred to him in his life, and yet he did not ever turn on God. No matter how bad, no matter how fair, no matter how unreasonable from our perspective it seemed to him, in fact, we have the passage here where it says that Job got up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell on the ground, and he said, Naked I have come from my mother's womb, and naked I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord takes away, but the name of the Lord will be praised. And in all this, Job did not sin. Even in the passage when his own wife, the closest relationship he has, like, come on, just curse God and die. Things are bad. Just die. It would be so much better than to keep enduring this suffering. Just let God kill you. Curse him and let die. He does it when his friends come with their hard names to pronounce. Um, and they tell him all these things. Like, surely you must have done something wrong. Admit it. God wouldn't be punishing you if you didn't do all these bad things. Now come on and confess it now. He knows he didn't do anything wrong. But he still doesn't turn God, no matter how angry, no matter how unfair, no matter how the people around him turned. He said in chapter 13 of Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's in the King James. No matter what happened, Job remained faithful to God. 
I think of an example of a modern day person, a man by the name of Nick Diaz. In 1982, he was born and he has no arms and no legs. Maybe, I don't know if some of you, he has a lot of YouTube videos and other things. But growing up, he struggled a lot emotionally, as you could imagine, not having arms and legs. And you think, why is this happening to me? You know, you see all these other people able to do things that they take for granted every day, walking, lifting, moving things, and you not having arms and legs. He tells the following testimony after he found Jesus in his life. When I'm asked how I claim to have a ridiculously good life when I have no arms or legs, people assume that I'm suffering because of what I lack. They inspect my body and they wonder how I could possibly give my life to a God who allowed me to be born with no limbs. Others have attempted to soothe me by saying that God has all the answers and when I'm in heaven, you'll find out why God did this. But instead, I choose to live by what the Bible says, that God has an answer today, yesterday, and always. But when people read about my life and they witness the way that I live, they are going to congratulate me, or they want to congratulate me for being victorious over my disabilities. But I tell them that is not my victory. My victory came in surrender. It came when I could acknowledge that I am not able to do this on my own. When I came to God and I said, God, I give it to you. And once I yielded to God, God took away my pain. And he turned my life into something good. And he gave my life meaning in some way that nothing else ever could. When I tell people that God can look at someone like me, someone even without arms and legs, and he has allowed me to become his hands and his feet. You see, it's not about your ability. It's just about being willing to serve God. You see, we came to a real understanding that all of us need to do so many times Whatever unpleasantness happens to us, whatever displeasurable thing occurs, we, as human beings, tend to focus on those things. And of course we do for a time, but sometimes we, we dwell on it. And we begin to think, woe is me, I can't get over this barrier. This wall is too big. This obstacle is too hard to climb. But the truth is that whatever is there, God has given to us in the life as an enhancement. Although it might not be personally uh, pleasing to us in the immediate time. But God has allowed us to go through that because God does have a plan. And he wants to use it in a way. He wants us to develop a deepening faith and not a shallow faith that's just based on saying cliches or spouting out slogans. But he wants us to understand that when we follow him, when we place our faith in him, when we are willing to be obedient to him, then we are capable of doing all the things that he asks us to do. You see, we'll never know what we can achieve individually or even as a congregation if we are not willing to place our faith in Jesus and to be willing to follow wherever he leads us, even if at the time it seems unsafe or unpleasant or unusual to us. You see, all of us will face obstacles, we'll face barriers, we will face hard teachings. The only question is, how do we respond when we face them? Do we turn and we leave? Or do we look at Jesus and say, you have brought me here and I know you are the Holy One of God and I will follow you anywhere. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just continue to pray for you. We acknowledge your goodness and grace. When hard teachings, difficult times come to us, help us to understand and to be able to process and reflect on them. Help us to allow ourselves that in your due time and in your wisdom to go deeper, to allow us to gain faith by such experiences. That God, no matter how painful, how offensive or off-putting your will may be. Help us to be willing to gnaw on your deep truth and to grow, to be like you in all resumable ways. Become the men and women that you would want us to be. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray.
And this 